Hi, I'm Dr. Yingying Su. I'm the light microscopist from Sydney Microscopy and Microanalysis. Today we are going to talk about sample preparation and artifacts in light microscopy. I'll give special thanks to Associate Professor Philip Brett and Dr. Gerald Shami for their contribution to this talk. This module aims to dissect general workflow of sample preparation for bright field and fluorescent microscopy. And we will discuss artifacts during sample preparation and how to avoid them. In the end, we'll provide a basic understanding of how to prepare a satisfactory specimen for microscopy observation. When we talk about sample preparation, First, we make sure we preserve the morphology of the sample by fixation or embedding. During this procedure, artifacts might be induced by autolysis or during specimen preparation. Second, we have to make sure that antigens are available for antibody or fluorescent probe. And third, to make sure we preserve the antigen positions and where it should be. And last, we have to preserve the antigen reactivity for the antibody or fluorescent probe to bind into. Please remember, compromising the specimen preparation will lead to compromised image. When we talk about collecting samples for microscopy, we usually ask these questions. What is your sample? What size is the sample? Bacteria is under 1 microns in diameter, so we will need a high NA, high magnification objectives, such as 63 times or 100 times to observe. While yeast cells are around 3 to 5 microns in diameter, but other fungus varies in size. Mammalian cell cultures range from 10 to 30 microns. Tissue samples Depends on the way they were collected and the thickness from sectioning, it can be vary in size. Plant cells range between 10 to 100 microns are usually in rectangular shapes. So size does matter. And another question is, what do you want to observe using my light microscope? If you want to observe the dynamics of the organisms, you will need live cell imaging. The goal is to keep cells or animals alive during observations. But if you want to observe the static state at certain moments, like a snapshot, the goal is to fix your samples, then to preserve cells or tissues in as close as the live light state as possible. And the next question is, what microscopy techniques do you need? If you want to use bright view, and you can use different contrast methods, including bright view, dark view, DIC, face contrast, or polarized light. Or you want to use fluorescence microscopy, which might be white view fluorescence, laser scanning confocal, or spinning disc confocal, or even turf. More advanced techniques, including multi-photon, for intravital imaging or thick tissue imaging, or light sheet, lattice light sheet, or even super resolution, which including special sample preparation techniques. To collect non-adherent cells, we can use smear squash to immobilize them, or we can hold mounting on the slide, or we can use the cytospin to spin the cells onto the glass light, and it usually applied to bacteria, blood, sperm samples. For adherent cells, we recommend using glass cover sleeves, so glass chamber slides, or glass bottom dishes. Or you can buy those high optical quality polymer cover sleeve bottom dishes. We talk a bit more about glass cover sleeves. We have to compare normal plastic dishes versus glass. 
The thickness of stainless glass cover slip is ranging from number zero, which is around 0 0.08 millimeter, to number two, up to 0.23 millimeters. And thickness of standard plus culture dishes, it's over one millimeters. Why is so important? Because when you look at those objectives here on from different company, they always have a number is 0.17, or here on the left is 0.13 to 0.19. It shows the recommend cover slips for these objectives. Each objective, they have their working distance. You can see from the table one here, including all the common objective working distance. The low magnification, they have bigger working distance, so it doesn't bother it too much. But when you go to higher magnification, the working distance is so small, it's way much smaller than one millimeters and if you put it on the microscope and try to observe your sample through a thick plastic culture dishes you find that you cannot focus your sample with the high mag objectives and if you grow your cells on this thin cover slip which is around 170 microns and you can easily focus your sample it's very important because most of the time we have user bringing samples growing on the plastic culture dishes. They grow happily, but in the end, they can only observe them using maybe 10 or 20 times objective with a higher working distance. And some company have those objective which are a little bit advanced, which including the correction color adjustment like the objectives on the left, it can compensate the cover slip thickness from 0.13 to 0.19 millimeters. Glass have good optical quality over plastic with less chromatic aberration, low birefringence, and low autofluorescence. However, image intensity and qualities reduce dramatically with cover slip thickness variation. For 0.95 NA objectives, they even have 70% reduction of performance with 0.02 deviation. In this case, you can try to get the number of 1.5 high performance cover slip with only 5 microns deviations. And it's highly recommended for applications with high numerical aperture objectives for turf stat etc however the price for this high performance cover slip is about two to five times higher than normal standard number 1.5 cover slip however a lot of cells might not like the glass cover slip because they are too stiff for them to grip on it they prefer a softer surface for them to browse on it so we can also coat those glass cover slip with different coatings. Usually people will use polylysins and from 0.1 to 1 milligram per mil, or gelatin, or collagens, fibrinectin, laminin, or metric gel. At SMM Medicine, we can usually use fibrotome to collect tissue sections. Samples are usually fixed tissue or plants. Section thickness is around 10 to 200 microns. In the general histopathology lab, biopsy samples from different origins usually arrive in fixatives or fresh. Fresh samples must be immediately fixed. In this talk, we are going to focus on the sample preparation workflow for fixed sample. The definition of fixation is to preserve cell and tissues in the states as similar as possible to its living state 
and to allow them to undergo further preparative procedure without change. It aims to stop autolysis and to stop putrefactions by bacterial growth and to maintain or improve the tissue strength and stability to preserve the morphology of the sample as it continues through the processing stage. And also to preserve antigen reactivity for antibodies and fluorescent probes. There are two major types of fixatives, organic solvent and cross linkages. Organic solvents such as methanol, ethanol, or acetones. And cross-linking fixatives are usually aldehydes such as formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde. Formaldehyde is usually used for immunocytochemistry in light microscopy. Other chemicals such as osmium tetroxide can use as post-fixative for lipids. Actually, the actions of most of these fixatives is still poorly understood. Here is the table to compare common uh, fixative for fluorescent microscopies. Please notice that in here, uh, the glutaraldehyde can cause high autofluorescence into your sample. Different fixative can cause different outcome. Here's an example. And this paper, it shows the, uh, Confocal image of red hepatic endothelial cells with different fixative, including ice cold methanol, paraffin aldehyde, and paraffin aldehyde mixed with glutaraldehyde. aldehydes. Methanol staining reveals fast and fast cell staining in a diffuse way presenting in all the cytoplasm and in the nucleus, while paraffin aldehyde reveals the fast L and fast L at one side or an opposite side in the cytoplasm. In the nucleus, one or two dots could be observed, but less than in methanol stain preparations. With the combination of perfluorine aldehyde and glutide aldehyde, you can see either the fast and fast L can be CLC and then clear strong dot could be observed. As reported, the methanol permeabilize the cell membranes, disrupt the cytoskeleton, and lead to extraction of antigen and membrane lipids. For this reason, it's not advisable to use methanol for membrane-bound receptor. There's another example in this Nature Method papers showing ultrastructure change after fixation and permeabilization. Here they compare the methanol 2% PFA. 4% PFA for fixation, and also 0.05% of triton and methanol for membrane permeabilization. That's why it's good to compare different fixation and permeabilization methods when you prepare your sample. There are a few important factors for successful fixation. We usually fix samples at room temperature. However, you can also try to fix sample at lower temperature. It will slow autolysis and diffusion of fixative as well. The pH value of fixative is very important. To prevent extreme of acidity or basicity, fixatives are generally buffered to a pH between 6 to 8. Osmolarity and concentration of fixative must be carefully controlled as it can cause shrinkage of cells at higher concentrations. You should keep the size of the sample smaller than 4 mm thick, or it will cause insufficient fixation in the center of the sample. Different fixatives have different penetration rate, and it usually depends on first-order kinetics. For example, uh, you can look at the equation on the right, is the distance penetration in millimeters. So T is the time in hours and K is the metal wall constant for the fixative equations. For example, the pore for formaldehyde K value is 0.78 at room temp. That means in one hour, the penetration distance is 0.78 millimeter. 
please take an important note for fixation is you have to prepare and use the fixed leaf when it's fresh or you can store at minus 20 degree for more than, more, more than six months for paraffin aldehyde. The tissue should not be stored in PFA for long period of time. After fixation, you should remove your sample from PFA as soon as possible to avoid autofluorescence. Always check and try the right fixation protocol for your own tissue and find the proper techniques for you. Once a fixative solution has been determined, its administration either by immersion or perfusion fixation is another important consideration. For a small block of tissue or monolayer of cells, immersion fixation is typically advantageous as it's not technically challenging. However, there are a number of disadvantages associated with these techniques. And my cause in homogeneous fixation of the tissue, and also it will result in uneven staining and autolytic changes, which ultimately disrupt normal tissue organization. For extended exposure to the fixative solution, it also causes increased amount of total fluorescence of the tissue. Perfusion fixation is a process of administering fixative via the circularity system and it can perform via pump mediated, injection mediated or jet fixation. You can see the example on the right comparing immersion and perfusion and perfusion had more homogeneous fixation and homogeneous staining in the end. After fixing tissue, the samples to be infiltrated with a sequence of different solvents, typically ethanol and silane, finishing in molten paraffin fax run by an automatic tissue processing machine. There are three main steps in tissue processing, namely uh, dehydration, clearing and infiltration. Each of these steps of the processing methods involve the diffusion of a sol solution into tissue and dispersion of previous solution in the series. In step one, alcohol replaces water in all cells. In step two, silane dissolves alcohol. And step three, paraffin displays silane. Specimen is now ready to be embedded. We use paraffin wax to embed fix and process samples in this cassette. Uh, for frozen sample, uh, use OCT compound to embed fresh tissue to frozen sections. Embedding converts the tissue into a solid form which can be further sliced. Sectioning provides the very thin specimen needs for microscopy. Usually it's 5 to 50 microns thick for better staining and imaging. Microtom is used to cut the formalin fixed paraffin embedding tissues for microscopy, thin slice then floating on a warm bath and collecting using a clean glass slide for further staining. Cryostat is used to section frozen tissue embedding by OCT. Thin slice of sample then directly collected on a clean glass light and quickly fixed with ice cold methanol or other fixatives. Vibratum can also be used to cut fixed tissue up to a thousand micron thick. Here I'd like to directly quote um, the information I got from the Leica Microsystem website about confocal optical section thickness and the answers to questions. What is a comparatively thick sample and how thick actually is an optical section? Here depends on various parameters. The full width half maximum is around 0.5 micrometers. It's a true confocal scanning microscope 
optical sections. So a thick sample usually refer to at least five microns. A very typical numbers for sample used for standard confocal application would be 50 microns. So usually for sectioning, keep your sections under 50 microns or you have trouble fixing and staining your sample or even imaging. Although we don't have all the processing machines at SMM, there's always help around the corner. Here is the histopathology lab at CPC level two. You can contact the lab manager that will offer training and help for histology sample preparation. There's no need to struggle. After we choose an appropriate method and thickness for sectioning your tissues, next step, we're going to talk about staining. As we mentioned before, 5 to 50 micron sections are often a good choice for most experiments. Anything thicker than that and you begin to have trouble with staining and imaging or you will need other advanced techniques such as tissue clearing and multi-photo microscopy. Staining can help to increase contrast and lower the background for light microscopy observation. Staining is used to enhance the contrast and label the targets of interest within the sample or for further observations. The routine histochemical staining is hematoxylin and eosin, HNE, in the histopathology lab. Hematoxylin precisely stain nuclear components, include heterochromatin and nucleoli, while the eosin stains cytoplasmic components, including collagen and elastic fibers, muscle fibers and red blood cells in a pink color. Other special stains are usually used as a probe to identify certain tissue morphology in normal and abnormal tissues. According to the Biological Stain Commissions, there are 64 stains are on a certification based with the BSC. Immunohistochemistry staining includes chromogenic labeling and fluorescent labeling. The most commonly used enzymes for chromogenic labeling are horseradish peroxidase, HRP, which convert the DAB into brown products, while alkali phosphatase, which is convert AEC into red products. For chromogenic labeling, signal amplification techniques can be used to enhance the sensitivity. You can use evident biotin complex method or label streptovidin biotin method. And later we'll talk about a bit more on fluorescent labeling. Here are a few examples from uh, research papers or from our users. The image at the top for HNE staining, the nuclei appear blue, the cytoplasm and other tissue elements appear as pink, while the MROIs appear pink against a pale background on the bright view image. With the conco red staining, MROIs appear biofringent apple green color against a dark background using polarized light imaging. The image at the bottom is brain tissue sessions with Golgi cox staining. This is a silver staining technique for visualizing the dendritic branching pattern and dendritic spines. This is a prepared image by our user at Brain and Mind Center. For first staining, we usually have the following tools for your labeling kit. First, of course, is glass slide and cover sleep. 
Remember the thickness is number 1.5? Make sure they're clean and dry. And also we can use some disposable transfer pipette, filter papers, tweezers to hold your sample, timer. A wet staining chamber is very important to keep the samples moisture. And multimedia we'll talk about more later. And clean nail polish to seal the sample and the slide box for sample storage. The fluorescent molecule, also called fluorophores, are compounds able to emit fluorescence. The fluorescent chemical compounds absorb light at one spectrum and emit light at a different spectrum, which you might have heard in the previous talk. The fluorescent label is a process of covalently attach a fluorophore to another molecule, such as a protein or nucleic acid. The chemist continue working on developing brighter and more stable fluorophores for light microscopy. The first generation fluorophores, such as fluorescein, fissi, and rhodamine, they bleach very quickly and are quenched when bound to antibodies. Second generation cyan dyes are Texas red. They're more photostable and higher quantum yield. In the 1999, third generation fluorophores coming out as the alexafluor dyes, ato dyes, and d light dyes. They offer a wide range of excitation wavelength and had a higher photostability and higher quantum yield. In 2000s, the quantum dot and heavy metal nanocrystal has been used and they are not tend to photo bleach and much, much brighter. And their wavelength of emission is tunable depends on its size. However, the penetration is a problem for it because it's bigger size comparing to Alexa diet or other organic diet. Recent year, the large stove shift dye or photoswitchable dyes are more popular for super resolution microscopy or multiplex imaging. To pick the right fluorophore for your sample preparation, you have to follow the following guideline. First and foremost, you better know the capability of your instruments, what laser lines we have, and what optimal filters if you use what few fluorescence, what objectives you're going to use, and temperature and time control are also very important. When you select the 404, you can use the fluorescence spectral viewer online to select the right 404 to avoid crosstalk and to pick the maximum brightness matching your laser line on your L or light source on your instrument. Try to choose the brightest fluorophore for your least expressed protein. And if you can, select far red diet to lower the autofluorescence in the tissues. Fluorescent proteins are widely used for live cell and live animal study. Please spend some time watching this video, Fluorescent Proteins and the Story Behind GFP by Roger Chen on iBiology. Roger Chen was awarded the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discovery and development of the green fluorescent protein. In collaboration with Osamu Shimomura and Martin Chalfi. Fluorescent protein can be used to incorporate and express in different organelles in colors, ranging from blue fluorescence to far red. However, the disadvantage of fluorescent proteins include the time is very time consuming and it can generate reactive oxygen species and the fluorescent proteins can change the normal biology function when they incorporate into the DNA and fluorescent protein also have lower photostability and sensitivity comparing to synthetic organic fluorophore Synthetic organic fluorophores have for a long time served as a tool for in vitro imaging of biomolecules as early as the 1940s. 
They can use directly to label targets such as the organelles, or they can conjugate to antibodies for immunostaining. First, I'm going to show some commonly used synthetic fluorophores for direct labeling. Here, Hush and Popidimaldi are usually used on the live dead assays on mammalian cell culture. Hush is a membrane permeable nuclear dye. It labels live and dead cells with blue fluorescence. While Popidium aldi is non membrane permeable and it only stains cells with compromised plasma membrane. That P and Cytox green are other nuclear stains that usually use as a counter stain. That P is semi permeable to live cell and show blue fluorescence. And Cytox green also stain fixed cells and shows green fluorescence. Cytox green is usually used as alternative nuclear dyes if you don't want blue fluorescence. And in here, DIOC6 and mitotrackers can use to label mitochondria. DIOC6 stain mitochondria at low concentration, and then it will stain ER and other organelles at higher concentrations. It is usually used for membrane potential measurement. Mitotracker series has lots of different colors. And mitochondria red stain mitochondria in live cells, and it also well retained after aldehyde fixation. Antibodies are widely used in immunoassays to detect and quantify antigens. When antibodies are used as fluorescent labels, they need to have a fluorescent molecule attached to them so they can be visible in the fluorescent microscopes. The reactive group can react with ter and terminal group of the antibody chain, binding the fluorophores to the protein. For immunostaining, here I list the typical protocol for immunocytochemistry or immunohistochemistry. On the left, you can see it includes fixation, permeabilization, if you need the dye to penetrate through the membrane, um, a couple of washes, blocking, and you put the primary antibody, wash excess amount of primary antibody, and you put the secondary antibody, and you wash your secondary antibody, and then you mount your sample. For immunohistochemistry, and it involves a little bit more steps, including extra embedding and cutting of the tissue session, the paraphernizing and rehydration session, and antigen retrieval before you do the antibody staining. We use antibodies for immunostaining. There are polyclonal antibodies or monoclonal antibodies. Polyclonal antibodies contain multiple clones of antibodies produced to recognize different epitopes of the same antigen, while monoclonal antibodies contain identical antibodies coming from a single clone of B cells to recognize a single epitope on the antigen. These two types of antibodies have their own advantage and disadvantage. For example, polyclonal antibody at high level of labeling. However, my uh, each batch of the antibody might be different because they are generated from different clones. Monoclonal antibody has the highest specificity. However, the label uh, the level of labeling might be lower than the polyclonal antibody. Labeling methods including direct or indirect labeling. Direct labeling is primary antibody with the fluorescent dye directly bind to 
your antigen. However, it's difficult to make each time you have to make a new antibody with the fluorescent diet. In direct labeling, including primary antibody, fluorescent label as a secondary antibody directly against the primary antibody. And you can also have multiple indirect labeling with different fluorochrome. Here's a little practice for antibody titration, which is very important for your experiment. It aims to determine best dilution for both primary and secondary antibody that are required to label specific structure. Why do we need to do a titration? Of course, first, you need to optimize your signal, especially for multicolor labeling. And then you can achieve saturation and minimize background. Of course, it's very important to have control. The control we usually set up is the secondary antibody alone with no specific binding. And also we better test the sample for negative and positive control. Please mark down each batch number, catalog number for each antibody you're titrating. As I said before, for some of the polyclonal antibody, each batch might have different uh, level of expression. You should titration each new vial of antibody you receive in your lab. You can use this form to help you with the correct titration for your antibody for your experiment. This is working from 10, 1 to 10 to 1 to 1,000. And the recent year, the multiplexing and multispectral imaging technique is very popular, especially for FFPE slides. I'm going to go quickly introduce the OPPO system, codec system, and the mix system. And the Akoya OPPO multiplex IHC kit, it can label PPFE slides up to seven colors. Based on the TSA technology, Tiramin signal amplification technology. By doing that and using the microwave to carry of excess amount of dye, so you can add multiple colors on top, you can get up to seven colors on the OPPO staining. And then you can use the multispectral imaging with a different detector, you can separate those seven colors. And in this method, you can even use to get rid of autofluorescence on the FFPE size. We have one system called Mantra at SMM, which is for multispectral imaging. The OPPO system and the multispectral imaging, it's originally developed from Perkin Alma and then it's sold to Akoya. Akoya's codex technology uses an antibody conjugated to proprietary Akoya barcode, comprised of a unique oligonucleotide sequence. This codex assay targeting specific barcode with a dye label reporter for high specific detections. While the Maxima instrument is a fully automated imaging system based on fluorescent microscopy. So this multi-parameter imaging cell screen technology can unite it with the broad spectrum of available antibodies, enable you to analyze hundreds of markers within a single sample. Once we finish stating the sample, we'll talk about how to mount and seal the sample before imaging. The choice of mounting media should be driven by reflective index matching with the objective. Okay. 
The antifade reagent is added to avoid photo bleaching. The active ingredients usually include PPD, MPG, or DEPCO. Those are usually mild reducing agents that scavenge the residual oxygen. The commonly used mountains, including thermal fissure scientifics, prolonged or slow fade antifade mountains, city floor, Victor shoe, or you can make homemade mounting media such as Mount Boy with Dapco. It has to be quite careful if your sample is using the hardening uh, mounting media. You have to be careful the axial direction might be got compressed during hardening. Also very important note is that please do not buy mounting media with that P inside because it will cause excess amount of background information, you have a lot of background noises, and also the excess amount of DAPI you can't get rid of because it's already in the mounting media. You can always add the last step of staining with one, to one uh, microgram per mil for five to 10 minutes in a separate step, and then rinse off the excess amount of DAPI, and then you can mount your sample. Then you can use different type of sealant to seal your sample to avoid evaporation. The most commonly used, of course, is nail polish, uh, but we can also use twin seal 22, which is one to one mixture of the yellow and the blue twin seal. Or nowadays we use and use bondic, which is a liquid plastic welder to fix uh, to mount the slides. You can also use dental wax or how make a uh, Visaline mount uh, sealant. And you can also buy those imaging spacer that are a bit more pricey. And or gym frame, also another imaging spacer and sealant as well. You can also try bee wax, egg rolls, or even adjustment jelly. But remember, please wait until it dried, then you put it on the microscope. Or once you get onto the objective, it's very hard to get rid of. Sample storage you highly recommend in the dark at four degrees. And you can see here is an example for the sample storage condition change. Um, well, the sample stability is time and temperature dependence. You see, once you prepare the sample in day seven and four degrees, your samples still keep not much different from day one. But while longer than day seven, the sample uh, information start degrading and disappearing. And on day 28, there's no signals left. The second part, we talk about artifacts. And first is how to target artifacts in your imaging. And what cause these artifacts and how to avoid or eliminate those artifacts. How to find out artifacts. First, you'd better check all the reagents for expiry date, if it's sterile, the temperature to keep the sample and composition or if it's a visible precipitation of the antibody. Control is the most important. You have to have the positive control and negative control. For positive control, you should use a specimen with a higher antigen content. This is the best way to test the sample preparation and labeling protocols. For negative control, you can use a non-specific secondary antibody or you can leave out a primary or secondary antibody and see if you see any non-specific binding. The positive and negative control, you should use it each time in your sample preparation to validate the result. Non-specific binding can cause artifacts and high background. It can be problematic during 
a model for sustaining. So different ways to circumvent this issue include blocking with serum from the same species of the secondary antibodies, or use PSA, lysine or fish skin gelatin. Background staining is an artifact caused by the nature of the biological samples. Coating the covers with collagens or fibronectins is a strong source for non-specific background staining. Sometimes air dry is another common source. To avoid by using pond von of lysine incubation of extensive washing with PBS. Another artifact is during specimen preparation, for example, using of detergents such as Triton or Twins for a long period of time or high concentration may cause in the relocation of the structure of molecules of interest. For example, the membrane protein might relocate and distribute into the whole cytoplasm. A big source of uh, artifact is introduced by autofluorescence. So we talk about autofluorescence, we we'll want to know what causes autofluorescence. It can be intrinsic fluorescence from the sample, such as lipofusions, NADH, collagen, elastin, etc. Fixative also in, uh, can induce autofluorescence during sample preparation. Gluten aldehyde or formalin can cause autofluorescence and samples, or air drying can also cause autofluorescence. Here is an example of the autofluorescence causing by gluten aldehyde. When increasing the concentration of gluten aldehyde in the fixative, you can see the background fluorescence start increasing. What can we do with autofluorescence? First, of course, we try to avoid it, but it's not always possible. We can choose not to use aldehyde fixative. Uh, we use different fixative to avoid gluten aldehyde. Here for light microscopy, we always recommend using the paraform aldehyde for percent in different buffer. However, it's not always possible. So secondly, we try to filter it during image acquisition. But it's also difficult because autofluorescent use has a broad range of emission spectra. We can use spectral unmixing using spectral detector on the confocal microscope. Or we select the fluorophore, which is well separate apart. And another method, we can try to quench it or remove it, but it will end up reducing the real signal. Different paper has to publish the method of quenched autofluorescence, including using UV, sodium borohydride, lysine or glycine, or sodium black and ethanol, and other solutions. Spectral imaging coupled with linear and mixing is an advanced technique used to discriminate individual emission spectra from four false combinations. This analysis is to determine the relative contribution from each four four for every pixel of the image and ultimately separate each four folds. We can use the spectral detector on the confocal to run spectral scanning, which is with the resolution to one to 10 nanometers, or using the de multispectral detectors on the camera with multispectral imaging, or we can also run fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopies in the end to separate each fluorophore. Or you can use spectral separation via sequential scanning 
to separate fluorophyll, which is closed together to avoid crosstalk. To quench autofluorescence, we can compare the sample with or without UV radiations. You can see image on the left has way more autofluorescence backgrounds than the image on the right. Using sodium borohydrides can also help to reduce background fluorescence, but be careful, you might reduce your real signal as well. With the glycine, it can also help to reduce background fluorescence. In summary, we have a couple of key points that list below. First, you have to plan your experiment from start to finish. It's the most important step. Remember that getting the right, getting it right, it will save you a lot of time. And think carefully before you're trying to observe and measure, and prepare your sample in the best way for the techniques you intend to use. So, which microscope you want to use is very important for your sample preparation. And you have to select the right marker or fluorophores for your staining. And of course, choosing the correct mounting medium to match the objectives you're going to use. And using the right cover slip, remember number 1.5, part 17 millimeter thickness. And of course, you have to run a pilot study. And each sample should uh, have a different protocol, so you should work out your own protocol. And don't forget always keep positive and negative control for each batch of experiment you're preparing. Here is a couple of reference uh, online information that you can go to. Very important is the Molecular Pro Handbook from Thermo Fisher. And you can go online for PDF version of the Molecular Pro Handbook. Uh, Spectral Viewer for you to select the right fluorescent probe for your sample staining. And also a couple of links from GE, Nikon, Leica, or Carl Zeiss. They have a lot of knowledge about good sample preparation and selection of mounting media. Thanks for our colleagues from SMM for the support and contribution to this talk. Thank you.